Hey there everyone. Today I'd like to discuss David Hume's argument against causality from an enquiry concerning human understanding. This is a really great essay for understanding Hume's empiricism in all its aspects. And in this lecture we're going to be looking at the development of the early parts of Hume's empiricism in order to understand how he comes to the conclusion that causality of cause and effect is never actually something we glean from experience. Instead, it's something we impose upon experience based on prior experience in order to predict and understand the world. Hume begins by differentiating between two different types of thought. That is, those concerning relations of ideas and those concerning matters of fact. Now, relations of ideas are intuitively or demonstrably certain, he says. They're discoverable by the mere operation of thought, without dependence on what is anywhere existent in the universe. His example that he gives is that 3 times 5 is equal to half of 30. So, right, 3 times 5 is 15, which is half of 30. And this operation doesn't depend on any extant object in the universe. All it depends upon is the definitions of numbers that we have created, such that we have a logical system where when I have discrete numbers and I do a discrete operation, I get a discrete result. And it is a logical certainty at that that I arrive at one result and one only, at least in the case of these very simple arithmetic and algebraic operations. And there's, there's certain branches of mathematics which are Hume would probably argue are abstractions and are not based on experience. They are more theoretical and thus are not um, logically bound in quite the same way, although I'm not sure that I'm equipped to really go beyond that amount of speculation. But nevertheless, Hume sees that we have ways of talking about ideas which are abstractions but are nevertheless logically certain and logically related to one another such that you have, for example, the Pythagorean theorem is another one that he mentions, where this is a priori true, meaning prior to any experience. And these relations of ideas can be a priori because they do not depend on an experience of an outside object at the same time in which the thinking of this relation of ideas takes place. Right? I can think about these numbers as completely abstract and not have something out, out there to, to look at. Now, matters of fact are a little bit different, and he says that they're also not conceived of and ascertained in the same manner. He says the contrary of every matter of fact is still possible, because it can never imply a contradiction and is conceived by the mind with the same facility and distinctness as if ever so conformable to reality. That the sun will not rise tomorrow is no less intelligible a proposition and implies no more contradiction than the affirmation that it will rise. So what he's saying here is that matters of fact do depend on some object out there beyond my mind which I'm perceiving, and I'm experiencing states of affairs. But one of the things that differentiates these things which I glean from experience is that there are many possibilities. And matters of fact are always, for Hume, possibilities, whereas relations of ideas are certainties. Right? They're, they're logically certain that there is no wiggle room with relations of ideas. But with matters of fact, he says, for example, is it a contradiction to say that the sun will not rise tomorrow? Certainly we can imagine 
I don't know. For example, and this is something Hume is also going to say is not a contradiction, that the laws of physics just cease to exist. Because <laughs> Hume says that those two are gleaned from experience, from seeing enough things happen that we deduce, oh, these laws are undergirding all these things, and it helps us predict the universe. But Hume says that any of these things which we glean from experience, it would not be a contradiction to suppose that they'd be another way. Because there's no logical reason why they must be that one way and not another way. Since, you know, if you do probability in mathematics, for example, nothing is ever 100% certain unless it's one of these relations of ideas. And in every other case, you might have a 99.999% certainty, but never 100%. So he says that these propositions, as strange as they may be, such as that the sun will not rise tomorrow, it is not an unintelligible proposition. It can be intelligible and does not imply a contradiction, and therefore is a possibility as slim of a possibility as that may be. So the point here is that with relations of ideas, we can know them a priori and we can deduce them, right? Deductive logic is 100% certain. It is true or false. It is two discrete states. But inductive knowledge is the kind of things that we have about matters of fact. They are probabilities. They are a spectrum. Next, Hume moves from these two forms of knowledge we've spoken of to a third, which is that of knowing cause and effect. Hume says that, for example, when we look at fire, we see that heat and light are collateral effects of fire, and the one effect may justly be inferred from the other. But, he says, I shall venture to affirm as a general proposition, which admits of no exception, that the knowledge of this relation, namely cause and effect, is not in any instance attained by reasonings a priori, meaning prior to experience, but arises entirely from experience when we find that any particular objects are constantly conjoined with each other. So this is what Hume sees behind causality, so to speak, is in events which are conjoined with one another temporally. They take place in time, one after the other, they take place in space in relation to one another. But we don't know this a priori. We figure this out from experience. Just like we learned, for example, that fire burns us only after touching it on accident or being told enough times that it will do so and being reasonably close enough to fire to deduce that, yeah, it's only going to get worse if I get closer. But he says, no object ever discovers by the qualities which appear to the senses either the causes which produced it or the effects which will arise from it. Nor can our reason, unassisted by experience, ever draw any inference concerning real existence and matter of fact. So what he's saying here is that, for example, if we do look at fire, there is nothing inherent to fire that would lead us to believe that it will burn us, that we can see from merely the sensible qualities of it, from merely looking at it and perceiving its luminosity or feeling the warmth, right? Because there's obviously a difference from the warmth from being far away versus being really, really close. In fact, the reason that we can infer this causal relationship of I touch the fire is the, right, the thing that I engage in, the cause is the fire and it affects me by burning me. The only reason we can know that is through experience. Again, either through directly experiencing it ourselves or being able to reasonably infer that the cause and effect will follow in such a manner by being told so. And Hume says that actually we like to think that we can rationally infer these cause and effect. Rationally, which is to say we can detach ourselves from experience and come to knowledge a priori. An example of a rationalist, for example, would be Kant. But Hume is an empiricist. He thinks that knowledge comes from experience. And it comes from getting accustomed to experience 
And we use things like habit to justify, justify, inferring certain things about the world. And most of the time, these are just. But in an absolute sense, he's trying to show that they are in fact not certain, but they are merely probable, even if they are highly probable. And he says that we fancy that were we brought on a sudden into this world, we could at first have inferred that one billiard ball would communicate motion to another upon impulse, and that we needed not to have waited for the event in order to pronounce with certainty concerning it. So, right, we like to think that it's just obvious that a cause follows an effect in a certain manner and results in a certain state of affairs. But Hume says, actually, there's nothing rationally present in the sensible qualities of the thing experienced that would lead us to conclude an effect with rational certainty, a priori. Now he says that this is going to lead to something interesting. Were any object presented to us, and were we required to pronounce concerning the effect which will result from it without consulting past observation, after what manner, I beseech you, must the mind proceed in this operation? It must invent or imagine some event which it ascribes to the object as its effect, and it is plain that this invention must be entirely arbitrary. This is cause and effect. Hume sees it as something that we must, sure, maybe extrapolate from experience but which is nevertheless not pregnant within that experience, but rather something which results from our abstracting away and concerning our relations of ideas. And we use things like habit, for example, to conclude that, yeah, I could probably say that this thing causes this thing because I see it following from it so often. But he says the mind can never possibly find the effect in the supposed cause by the most accurate scrutiny and examination. For the effect is totally different from the cause and consequently can never be discovered in it. Motion in the second billiard ball is a quite distinct event from the motion of the first. Nor is there anything in the one to suggest the smallest hint of the other. A stone or piece of metal raised into the air and left without any support immediately falls. But to consider the matter a priori, is there anything we discover in this situation which can beget the idea of a downward rather than an upward or any other motion in a stone or metal? So right, once again, he's circling back to this idea that, for example, the idea that objects fall down or that the motion of one billiard ball hitting another one will cause it to veer off in a certain direction. There's no contradiction in imagining that what we suppose to be the effect could not be otherwise. There's no logical contradiction, for example, with the idea that if I drop this book, it will fall up. Now, we would have no reason to justly infer this without some sort of evidence from experience, which would lead us to believe that it will fall up, but nevertheless, it is not logically contradictory. Sure, it is contingent upon a bunch of contrary evidence, such as what we know about gravity, but once again, it is not something which we could a priori say is entirely logically impossible. And because cause and effect are completely different from one, another, from one another, namely they are different events. For example, in the case of fire, we have the entity fire, which is the cause, and the effect being the burning. And these are two distinctly different things. Now, we see time and time again, if you do a trial, for example, and you have 50 instances of touching fire every time you'll get burned. Now we will deduce that it is certain that fire is the cause of the effect 
of being burned, but in fact, we have merely induced this with a very high probability. So the difference between the cause and effect is actually ontologically distinct, but we bridge that with our mind. He says, when I see, for instance, a billiard ball moving in a straight line towards another, even suppose motion in the second ball should by accident be suggested to me as the result of their contact or impulse, may I not conceive that a hundred different events might as well follow from that cause? May not both these balls remain at absolute rest? May not the first ball return in a straight line or leap off from the second in any line or direction? All these suppositions are consistent and conceivable. Why then should we give the preference to one when in no more consistent or conceivable than the rest? All our reasonings a priori will never be able to show us any formation for this preference. Right? Because this preference for causality is not a priori. It's a posteriori. It comes after a certain amount of experience such that we deduce that, yeah, it's probably not the case that this billiard ball is just going to jump over the one that it hits and not actually affect it. We assume with good justification, but not with logically certain justification, that the cause will lead to the effect of the second billiard ball moving off in a certain direction. Thus he concludes, in a word then, every effect is a distinct event from its cause. Right? Fire, cause, burning, effect. Two distinct events. It could not, therefore, be discovered in the cause, and the first invention or conception of it a priori must be entirely arbitrary. And it's important that he says the first invention or conception of it, meaning before we've actually interacted with fire, to attribute to fire the power to yield the effect of burning is entirely arbitrary. It's something we just made up. But of course, you don't, you don't make it up after you've experienced it. You say, well, based on my experience, it is the case that fire leads to burning. So after that point, it's not arbitrary. It becomes steeped in, as Hume is trying to show with his empiricism, experience. It's grounded in what we've already experienced. And even after it is suggested, the conjunction of it with the cause must appear equally arbitrary, since there are always many other effects which, to reason, must seem fully as consistent and natural. In vain, therefore, should we pretend to determine any single event or infer any cause or effect without the assistance of observation and experience. So that's what he's trying to show. Cause and effect is not logically necessary. It's a convention, which is a relation of ideas, used to understand matters of fact. So I hope this has been interesting and helped make sense of Hume's philosophy. I find Hume quite interesting, particularly because he tries to dispel with philosophy as an abstraction. He's trying to make it more concrete, more based in the world, and not some sort of mysterious chimera, as he puts it. Um, he's very clear, very methodical. This is a great volume that you should check out if you're considering Hume. You can see by my flags, I've quite enjoyed it. It's very short. Check out any of my other lectures that I've done on postmodernism, German idealism, gender theory, postcolonial studies, and other literature. Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a private philosophy Zoom, which you can tailor to your needs. I also have super thanks available because books are not cheap. That's it for this lecture, and I'll see you in another one. <laughs>